Hey everyone, welcome to week 26, day three. This is Wednesday. The theme for this week is one room, one room. We chose the bathroom. You could choose any room that you want. On Monday, we painted Danny's shower cap. Yesterday, we painted our toothbrushes and our toothpaste. And today, I think uh, Danny's gonna show up in the painting, so that's gonna be pretty cool. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, let's get started. Let's do a small recap of the painting of Monday and yesterday's painting. Now on Monday, I think it was super important for me to acknowledge the fact that what interested me most about that room was its atmosphere. And it was an atmosphere that was created by light. So yes, I was aware that it is a halogen light, it is a bathroom. I know what that feels like. But like I said on Monday, it's quite different when you approach, you know, in this instance, a room, a, a very specific space through the lens of wanting to make a reflection on painting. When you want to paint something, your eyes tend to look at things differently. Now, ideally, if you really think about it, those eyes should be our only eyes, like that should be the way we look at nature. And I actually feel very strongly about this. I don't feel we should look at nature through reflective eyes just because we want to be better painters, but because through painting we are giving ourselves an opportunity to enjoy and learn from nature a lot more than if we were just living aimlessly and observing aimlessly, you know, through life. So I do feel that that's something that's incredibly beneficial of painting. It is in itself an exercise that can teach us how to observe with the hopes that in the end, uh, reflection through observation is turning us into a better version of ourselves. That to me is something that's incredibly, incredibly important when I am trying to understand something through painting. So yes, even though this is a place we inhabit daily, I know what my role is in this very specific space. But as soon as I kind of turn that switch and say, I am going to look at it and I'm going to try to understand it through painting, it is very, very different. It's almost like it changed its nature in a way. On Monday, the most impactful thing was just acknowledging that light, was just saying, yes, I understand that there's a temperature to this light. There's a sort of brightness to this light. There is an effect of this light in the atmosphere of this room. And as soon as my mind just noticed and connected light with atmosphere, I was like, yes, that is what I want to paint. The way this atmosphere affects everything that is being held in this space, within this space. That is it. That is immediately what is moving me about this space. It wasn't really about the shapes that compose this space. It wasn't really about looking at it in terms of an interior and just thinking of how can I describe the inner little spaces that are within this space. Um, no, no, I actually immediately felt air and immediately felt how the light was traveling through that air and affecting everything that it was on its way. If you really think about it, it's no different than just looking at your living room or looking at your closet or something that's void of light. The same effect of the amount of light that is available in that space should be what we're paying attention to when we decide to examine one of these rooms that we've chosen to do this exercise. There's a transformation that kind of happens that enables us to be far more open. And I've always said it, I, my hope is that we are in many ways free from prejudice, as hard as that sounds, that our observation is free from prejudice when we try to look at it from the shore of painting. Our biggest goal is not going to be just signified by the making of a painting. That is the end result. I, I really want to <laughs> sort of hammer that in throughout this week. The painting is going to be the natural result of this exercise, but it really isn't the end goal. The fact that we're there and we're sensible and we're trying to understand what aspect of this room we normally inhabit, what is it that we want to paint about this room? How are we affected by this room? That is what we're trying to paint. That is what we're trying to first understand, to first come to terms with, so that we can paint that. 
If it was just about painting objects, then none of this would really matter. Then the context of something wouldn't really matter. Then our eyes, the experience that have shaped the way we observe things, the way we perceive things, the way we understand things, none of that would matter. Everything would be a, a sort of a singularity. You know, a bathroom would just be a bathroom and it would be the same for every single human being out there and we would all observe it the exact same way. It would be entirely about the object. So we have to really convince ourselves that we are the ones that are reflecting ourselves onto everything that we see. We enter into this conversation with the uh, subject of our gaze, and we are shaping that which is moving us. And that which is moving us is shaping our gaze also. So it's this beautiful, eternal cycle that is hopefully feeding us as you know, very sensible beings. Ultimately, that is what constructs the way we see our vision, our perception. Through these exercises, I really, really believe this. I kind of understand the way I see a little bit better. And this is crazy because I feel that that is what is making me become closer to my painting practice. I don't know if the paintings are better. And, you know, people could argue, oh, you painted better 15 years ago, whatever. I don't really care about any of that stuff. I feel that the relationship that I have with paint right now is just immensely, immensely stronger than the one I had five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. To me, to me as a human being, that's the only thing that matters. That's absolutely the only thing that matters. So I'm incredibly happy and grateful about that. Now, yesterday's painting, y yes, it was about, again, grasping that atmosphere and saying, if I'm going to paint this atmosphere, and we're going to try to tie this with, you know, last week's theme where we were making sacrifices, like what does it mean to paint atmosphere? What are we going to sacrifice if we want to paint atmosphere? And what is most obvious to me is the fact that we have to sacrifice edges. We have to sacrifice those limits between one object and the other, because an atmosphere is just something that envelops everything. So if we are painting atmosphere, we're not just painting cups or a toothpaste or toothbrushes. No, we're not painting these individual objects that have a shape that is determined by its boundaries. We're not, those boundaries disappear. We're painting the enveloping of those shapes by this very powerful atmosphere. We have to ask, what is this atmosphere doing to these objects? I really started to understand this concept of air traveling through these objects and being far more important, far more prevalent. Uh, it had a presence, it had a bigger presence than the one uh, of those objects. So that presence of something that's kind of intangible is what I wanted to paint. Now for today, this is kind of like the cool part because in my mind, when I think of a very milky, soupy atmosphere, when I think of this bright, cool light that is affecting this small space that is the bathroom, I think of air, of something very moody, of something that doesn't really quite describe the objects that are in there, but that just moves around the space, invades all those boundaries and makes them disappear. And to me, that's almost like akin to something that's soft. It's almost like this very thick fog that is embracing everything that is on its path. When you visualize it as something that is material and tangible, you kind of realize that that's exactly what happens with light, the way light travels, the way light affects all the objects that are on its way. But I acknowledge that it's a lot harder to understand light as this very, very physical thing that you can actually touch and you can feel and you can see how it just goes from one form to the next. It's almost like this river that's going through everything. When you think of fog, when you think of steam, like you understand it far, far better. So I noticed that I was equating this atmosphere with this kind of softness, with this, this cloud of light that was just eating up everything that was in its way. And I realized, well, what happens if, yes, there is this atmosphere, yes, there is this light, but what happens if I want to be expressive about it? What happens if the painting doesn't really revolve around me trying to shorten a value scale and me trying to shorten a hue range 
what happens if my brush strokes are very essential in determining form? What happens if those strokes are very expressive, very expressionistic in nature? Would I be sacrificing some of that atmosphere? Would I be able to communicate atmosphere but do it through a very kind of strong, committed way? Because when I realized that I wanted to paint Danny in this painting, I also said, I want to describe her. I don't just want her to disappear. Even though she is being swallowed up by this whole atmosphere, I have a consciousness, a very heightened consciousness of her being there. And I want to be able to describe her. And you know how we were speaking about last week that we should aim to be the painters that we want to be? So I've always been a huge, huge fan of Russian 19th century painting and early 20th century painting. Itinerant painting, social realist painting. I think it's absolutely, incredibly strong painting. I mean, fascinating painting. And it's actually super cool to make parallels between what was American illustration and uh, Russian propaganda socialist realist painting because in many, many ways, they are the same. In many ways, it's actually closer to Norman Rockwell than what we would assume. I am a huge fan of this type of painting, and there are incredibly talented Russian painters at this moment. Now, you know, if you really think about it, when you think about these huge names of um, Russian itinerant painting, when you think of Kramskoy or uh, Repin or Serov, or Perov, or Levitan, countless and countless and countless other painters. You always see them as these almost names that are bigger than life. And we think that those are the guys, like those are kind of lighthouses. Those guys will show us the way and we should pay attention to them. And by all means, I mean, those painters are just beasts of painters. They are some of the best painters in painting history. So hell yes, of course, we have to look at Repin and realize, oh yeah, you know, this is an absolute genius. As big as Rembrandt, as big as Rubens, as big as any other painter that is huge in art history. But if you ask me, there is this guy, and this happened ever since I bought this uh, book on Russian social realist painting. It's a beautiful book, by the way. It's an absolutely gorgeous book. I saw this painting by Moiseyenko, Yevsey Moiseyenko. And it was these guys on horses that I was like, wait, wait a second. And um, I'm going to ask Danny to uh, show you a pic of this painting. Uh, unfortunately, there's no like really nice quality images of his work in the internet. So ugh, that's what happens when we just pay attention to uh, Western painting and we think that that is the whole of painting. But anyways, uh, when I saw this painting uh, printed in that book, I was like, whoa, this is like fetching on steroids. Like I love this painting because I love you know, very brushy painting. I absolutely adore brush strokes. And I think I adore brush strokes because I see them as this calligraphy of a painter's personality. I think that mark making, and that's why I think drawing is something that is so, so almost instinctual. It's so primal. It's so, so us as a species because it is direct. And if painting can borrow some of the qualities that drawing has, you know, in terms of mark making, then I think painting is at its most powerful. So that's why some of my most favorite paintings in painting history, they are beautifully sensitive, but they can also be very, very bold. Now, that doesn't mean that all I like is just expressionist painting and neo-expressionist painting. No, of course not. But there is something about, you know, this very kind of bold brushstrokes that just drives me nuts. It drives me crazy. And that's, you know, whenever I see one of those paintings, I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is who I am. This is home. It feels like home. You know, you may be super lost and you may not know how to find your way through the mess that is trying to figure out who you are as a painter. But when you look at paintings that you connect with, like your soul connects with, where you know that there is kinship there, that there is a relationship there, there is a bond there, even though I am somebody who's from Colombia looking at Russian uh, social realist paintings from the late 19th century, even though there is that almost rational disconnect, when I look at them, 
I feel like this is home, like this is me, the, you know, this is where I'm supposed to be. When I looked at that painting, my mind almost erased everything that was amazing about itinerant paintings. So Kramskoy just disappeared from my head. Repin just disappeared from my head. Serov just disappeared. It was that powerful. It is that insanely powerful the way I connected with this painting. And, you know, I, I started looking at Moiseyenko's work and everything, everything, the few paintings that I was able to find of his, every single one of them just I connected with. And I was like, this is, this is it. You know, this is me. I may not paint like that. And, you know, there may be a thousand reasons why we don't paint like the things we, we truly feel reflect us. But when I looked at it, I was like, yeah, this is, this is it. This is what I want to do. And even though today's painting, yes, it was about atmosphere. And yes, it, it was about Danny, you know, within this atmosphere, inhabiting this atmosphere. And I wanted to exalt the presence of Danny within this atmosphere. Even though it's it's a very simple painting, I was like, oh, I have to try and be bold. Because for me, the compromise of boldness is giving up accuracy. Sometimes when you just want to be bold and energetic and expressive, Sometimes you have to leave accuracy behind and, and being faithful to nature. And for me, that's super, super tough because even though I'm somebody who just revels in just experimenting and feeling comfortable doing something that is outside what I would consider my strengths or the things that I'm naturally attracted to, there's always something about the fundamentals of drawing and painting that inevitably creeps in and says, well, you better watch your drawing. Well, you know, that's not the right value. Well, just watch your shapes. Hey, that's a little too sharp. That's a little too strong. Well, just watch your saturation. Don't go crazy. I always have this side of my brain that's kind of reining me in, that's kind of telling me, hey, 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 watch it. You know, don't go overboard. Don't be nuts. You're still a very traditionally educated painter and you have to acknowledge those things. And sometimes, to be honest, I wish that side of my brain would just shut up and let me do just whatever the hell my more expressive side of the brain wants to do. But it's this inner turmoil constantly in my brain while I'm painting. These two sides are constantly, constantly bickering and fighting and fighting and fighting. And I think that that's kind of cool. I mean, it really shouldn't feel like you're a tormented soul, but I think that it shouldn't be easy either. I don't think that painting should be something where you feel like you're gliding and you're just smiling throughout your painting. No, I mean, some paintings may feel like that, but as a whole, it is a struggle. And that struggle has to be somewhere, and it has to be between two forces just fighting each other. And you have to acknowledge those forces and the places that they're trying to pull you. So for me, this, this soul that wants to be free and wants to be kind of not dependent on anything and not answer to anything, just wants to paint like Moise Yenko. I really, really do. I, I mean, when I see his paintings, I see freedom. I see the way a completely free mind can paint. And I just absolutely love that. This is a, a mind that is unbound, not beholden to anything. And I love that. I absolutely love that. And I'm probably romanticizing everything because I'm sure there's a ton of discipline behind Moise Yenko's painting. So I am completely aware of that. But this painting of Danny was just a small effort into trying to remind myself that I should try to go for those things, that I should try to be that painter because that is what I want to be. Like I said, nobody can teach you this. Nobody can tell you where your path is going to take you. Nobody can tell you what that path is going to be. But when we look at something and we connect with that, we know, like I said, we know we're home. Instinctually, we know it. And when I look at his paintings, I'm like, yeah, that's it for me. Like, this is my team. This is my village. Like, <laughs> you know, when I, whenever I'm going to die, I'm going to return to this village because that's where my people are at. So <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of cool when a painting just becomes an opportunity to remember those things. So I was very, very happy that I was able to take some of the atmosphere that I saw was present in Danny's shower cap on Mondays. And I was like, let's take that atmosphere 
and let's just <laughs> it's almost like crowning Danny with all that atmosphere and let's make her like the queen of this space. So I know that sounds weird, like Danny, the queen of the bathroom. That's not an amazing kingdom, but, but <laughs> anyways, that was it for today. So hopefully you guys can, um, can hang out with us tomorrow where we try to understand this space and the objects that occupy the space. I think I'm going to go with the objects again and see if I could find color and contrast within all this atmosphere and see what happens. So we'll see how that goes tomorrow. Thank you. Danny, queen of the bathroom. <laughs>